Well, good evening, church. Would you stand as we sing to Jesus Christ, who is our sure and steady anchor this evening? Let's lift our voices to Jesus. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few. holding fast to Jesus Christ tonight. When you know Jesus, you have a right relationship with the Father. And you get to know the Father as a rock and a refuge and a fortress, no matter what you're going through. Isn't that so good that through Christ we can know God as a rock and a fortress? We're going to sing of that in this next song as we sing, My Soul Will Wait.
we trust you and we thank you so much that we can know you it is a gift Lord I pray that you would help us to know you even more tonight help us to rejoice in what you're doing here it's in your name we pray amen you may be seated well good evening it is good to be back with you on this Lord's Day for this first Life Together Town Hall of 2023. Uh, you might remember that it was 2018, I believe, when I first started calling these town halls. And the reason I wanted to do it was because there was so much changing. There was so much tumult and so many so many things going around and so many questions being raised that we just needed a venue besides Sunday morning and besides even the normal Sunday evening where we could just talk about what was going on and all get on the same page. The, the town halls became in some measure some, uh, an opportunity for me to deliver news that was even shocking. Um, but uh, over the course of the years, as the Lord has been faithful and uh, things have calmed down and then gotten exciting and we've watched our uh, church be restored to health and strength and excitement, these uh, are becoming opportunities for me to share exciting things uh, that are going on. And one of the things that is true about life in a local church is I can't persuade you that things are different than they are. This is your body, this is your church, this is our congregation, and, and people just know when things are good. They know when things are tough, and they know when things are great. And one of the most remarkable things uh, about my ministry, actually since late 2020, so for about maybe a year and a half now, is the overwhelming number of people who come up to me and say, I can't believe how great things are at our church. 
I can't believe how encouraged I am about the things that are going on in the life of our congregation. I can't believe how encouraged I am about the leadership and the sweet spirit uh, that is the case in our church. I hear it all the time and I really feel it. It is a great and tremendous joy to be able to serve Jesus together. It is a great and tremendous joy to be able to worship and do life together. There really isn't another place in the whole world where I would rather be serving Jesus than right here in the heart and soul of Jacksonville with you wonderful people, our Christian family. And I'm so excited about all of the different things that are going on in the life of our church. And uh, I mentioned this morning uh, to some of you that actually one of the difficulties about the town hall tonight was trying to figure out the, all the good things that we would say when there's so many things to say, I'm not going to be able to say everything. So I want to give you kind of a flavor of some of the good things that are going on, and I hope uh, as enthusiastic and excited as you all are, uh, you'll feel even more so by the time we're done uh, here in just a few minutes. First of all, I want to let you know about the preaching ministry that's going to be happening here on Sundays this year. You've heard some talk about this, but uh, beginning, so next week we've got Sanctity of Human Life Sunday and Dr. Moeller will be here, talk about that in a minute. Uh, we get back to the normal preaching schedule the last Sunday in January, so two Sundays from today. And on Sunday mornings for most of 23, most of, most of our Sundays, I'll be preaching through the book of Acts, and we're going to be calling the sermon series Revival. We're doing this because... I am praying, hoping, trusting, and believing that God is going to do something monumental, something grand and glorious in our day. One of the things that so many of you have heard me say, because I think about it a lot, I talk about it a lot, I pray about it every day, is I'm asking the Lord to open up the heavens and pour out His Spirit in a fresh, in a bold, and in a powerful way. In history, that's been called revival when he does that. And the inspired book on revival in Scripture is the book of Acts. And so we're going to pay attention to Acts every week on Sundays, and we're going to look at how the narrative progresses. We're going to look at the theology that comes up in the book, which can be interesting to say the least. But we're also each week going to look at what is it that God does when he's doing something grand and glorious. Now, I'm going to be preaching it every week while I'm praying every week that we are studying this book so that we would recognize these things and we would have the opportunity to see them in our lifetimes. Then, on Sunday evenings, we're going to have a very special series. One of the sermon series we've had that I've heard the most praise about was our sermon series last fall, the Thankfulness in the Valley series, where you got to hear uh, from a rotation of pastors and all the good things that the Lord taught them during the hardest things in their life. Well, we're going to have another rotation of pastors this year in 2023, but this year they're going to be talking to us about how to love well. In this hateful world that we're all living in, that's just full of vitriol and anger and accusation. This church has to be a place of love. It has to be a place of care and compassion. Jesus Christ says, they will know you are my disciples when you love one another. We have to do this, and we have to do it well. And so on Sunday evenings this year, I'm really excited about our sermon series that we're calling Reclaiming Love, People of Compassion in a World of Hate. And you're going to be able to hear how you can grow in love, how you can show practical uh, acts of compassion to your brothers and sisters in this congregation and to a lost and dying world, you're going to hear from your pastors how you can do that. And I'm excited about that. So that's what's coming up on preaching on Sundays this year. But I want to tell you about some of the things that we have to celebrate from last year. Last year, we baptized 15 people and we had 104 people join the church. Now let me, yeah. 
Now, I'm thankful for that, and I'm excited about that too, but I want to say something about that. When I became senior pastor here, do you know we were losing four people a week? We were losing four people a week at First Baptist Church. People were leaving much faster than they were coming. And I am thankful that in 2022, we are able to say that we have stopped the bleeding and we have had some modest growth, for which I'm thankful. 15 baptisms is a little more than one baptism a month. 104 new folks is about two people joining the church a week. I am very, very thankful for that. I'm thankful to be in a much different spot than we were in just a few short years ago. But I also want to tell you, and this is where Acts comes in, we should not be content with that. We need to pray that this would be a down payment on great things that the Lord would do. Our, our mission statement is reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. So we've got uh, 104 down and like a million and a half to go. So, uh, so let's pray prayers of thanks that we're in a different spot than we were a few years ago. And then let's pray that this would be just the beginning of the good things that the Lord is going to do. Also, on the discipleship end of things, we have this year 391 people signed up for grow groups. So this is very exciting. This is not just people getting saved and then we don't hear from them again. This is people signing up to study the Bible, to pray and to grow in relationship. And 391 of you uh, are in grow groups, studying the Bible, loving one another in homes and coffee shops and offices all across Jacksonville. That is a remarkable reality. I'm very thankful for that. And we also want that number to grow. Christmas. I'll just mention Christmas. We talked a lot about uh, worship on Christmas Sunday. Churches all across the country uh, and churches all across Jacksonville canceled services on Christmas Sunday because they were afraid nobody would come. What's well, one of the reasons? Afraid nobody would come. Uh, but I just want you to know that uh, Christmas, December 25th, was one of our biggest Sundays of the whole year. We had a bump in attendance on Christmas Sunday. And I am so, th if you were here, if you were one of the ones that was here, it was really a delightful worship service together. <laughs> there, there are a couple of realities from that Sunday together that I know I'm just going to remember from the, for the rest of my life because they were so delightful and so joyful. And our family didn't miss a beat. We got up and opened presents and ate breakfast and then came down here, had a great time with you guys, worshiped the Lord, and then went back and ate till we dropped. So uh, we managed to squeeze everything in, and it was a great day. Let me talk to you about some events that are happening this year that we're really excited about. First of all, uh, you will be familiar with the name of our counseling min ministry that we've called the Grace Center. Uh, we are changing the name of that counseling center and that counseling ministry to First Counseling, just to kind of uh, uh, line up with the branding and the names that we have for a lot of the ministries in our church. We're calling that First Counseling. That's a new name, but it is not uh, a new direction for the ministry. This actually, the counseling ministry, many of you will know, is the way I got introduced to First Baptist. Uh, First Baptist Church had made a decision about 2011 that they wanted to have a biblical counseling ministry. They wanted what happened in the counseling room to line up with what was happening in the pulpit. And they brought me in uh, from ACBC to do some training here and some consulting. And that led to a lot of changes here. That led to me coming on as associate pastor and ultimately senior pastor. And all the time that I have been here, that counseling ministry has really been growing and strengthening. Uh, first, under Dr. Ernie Baker, that you know and love and appreciate so well. His leadership over there has been great. Um, Ernie is going to continue to serve with us on the pastoral ministry uh, staff at First Baptist, but he's decided he wants to take a step back a little bit, cool it. He's got a lot of grandkids and a lot of uh, uh, some other ministry interests that he wants to pursue. So he's going to remain on the pastoral ministry staff here uh, while Pastor Ryan Treziak becomes the new director of our counseling ministry called First Counseling. So we're really thankful for Ernie, for his service, that he's going to continue here, and for Pastor Ryan as he takes up the mantle of leadership at First Counseling. You should know 
Yeah, there you go. Count, clap for, clap for Ryan. <laughs> that counseling ministry does a lot of work. If, if you're not familiar with everything they do, it's, it's a lot more than what it sounds like. They're doing pastoral care and bereavement, uh, hospital visits. That all happens under the auspices of their ministry. They're also doing counseling for hurting people. And they're also training you to be counselors. We want to create a culture of care in our congregation with people who know how to draw near to others and help them in their times of trial and difficulty. Uh, First Counseling is doing all of that, and they are doing great work, and I'm very thankful for them. I also want to let you know, this spring, we are going to have our first mission trip since COVID. This, we had to put all of the mission trips on ice. We weren't allowed to do anything. Nobody wanted to do anything, even if we were allowed. And then when our church got ready, we tried to plan a few things and nobody wanted us to come. Everybody was COVID scared. And so now in 2023, we we are finally ready and other places are ready to receive us. And so our students this spring, this March, are going to be traveling to New York City to uh, share the gospel in uh, in that wonderful, crazy place. So uh, you can pray for them and you can be a part of it because tonight uh, at our Life Together Fellowship, you can get pretzels and pizza. And when you pay for that, all the proceeds go to helping students go to New York City and tell people about Jesus. So we're really excited about that. I told you this morning about our JSO Serve Day coming up on January 23rd and the 24th. That is going to be an opportunity for our congregation to serve food to all of the police officers in Jacksonville. JSO has told their officers, go to First Baptist and get free food on those two days. Uh, So that means we need your help to serve all these folks, to prepare the food, to greet them, to encourage them, to give them tours and to show them the new stop station that we're building so that they can have a safe, relaxed place to fill out their paperwork take a break, get a refreshment, and just have a safe place right here in the center of Jacksonville. So uh, you can go to fbcjax.com slash JSO to sign up to serve on one of those two days. And I really hope you will. We really want our officers to come into this place and see a lot of people who love them and support them or trying to care for them. Somebody told me we're 110 days away from the Israel trip which I am really, okay. You're you're amening that it's 110 days? Okay, (laughs) all right. So we're 110 days away from uh, our trip to Israel. That's gonna be a 10 day tour of the Holy Land. I am so excited about going with you to this. We're gonna see some incredible places. It's gonna be a once in a lifetime opportunity. It is an opportunity for us to not just see the locations of the Bible, it's also an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. One of the things I'm going to be talking about while we're over there is not just learning about and not just seeing where the events happened, but I want the Lord to stretch out our hearts and uh, to help us love Jesus Christ more. Another focus of the trip is that we would actually spend time together. I want this to be a time of true fellowship for those of us who go where we can just hang out, spend time together, grow together in our relationship. In fact, the trip sold out and the tour company called and they said, hey, if you keep, if you open up some more slots, we can get some more people going. And we actually just decided, I don't want to do that. We're going to let this trip sell out. There'll be other opportunities perhaps in the future. But if the trip gets too big, then it's just too many people roaming around and it's not really an opportunity for us to fellowship. So we've kept it a little smaller uh, so that we can spend time together and enjoy not just seeing the Holy Land, but seeing it together. I'm really looking forward to that. Can't wait to share that here in just a few months. Next week is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. You have heard me say for years that this is one of the most important things in my life. One of the most important things in my ministry is I want to be a part and I want our church to be a part of doing whatever we can do to end abortion. And so I told you years ago that every 
Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, whoever the president was and whether there was official, an official declaration that it was the day of Sanctity of Human Life or not, we were still going to take a Sunday in January and do what we could as a church to redouble our efforts and recommit our hearts to the sanctity of human life. About a year and a half ago, I called Al Mohler and I said, would you come and would you speak at First Baptist Church for Sanctity of Human Life Sunday on the 50th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And he said he would come. And when I invited him, I had no idea that between that invitation and his coming, Roe versus Wade would actually get overturned. Uh, we, I am very, very thankful that that happened. You should be very thankful that that happened. But you know that all that means is that the work is just beginning. Uh, and so we really have to roll up our sleeves. We really have to get down on our knees. We really have to do whatever we can to participate in the end of abortion. Judy Weber from First Coast Women's Services is also going to be here worshiping with us next week. And I'm going to remind you again and again, as I do every year, that we're going to take up a special offering uh, for that wonderful ministry, that remarkable ministry. And I want to ask you to begin to pray and to begin to even now give uh, towards that incredible, incredible ministry. Uh, Judy, I don't mind telling you, she wrote me a letter and she said that First Baptist Church has done more to partner with First Coast Women's Services and has done more to end abortion in Jacksonville than any other church in Duval County. And so that's you guys, that's your commitment, that's your love for lost people, that's your love for unborn babies, and we need to just keep it up and do so more and more. That'll be next week. Also next week in the evening, we're going to be a part, First Baptist Jacksonville is going to be a part of the Ask Anything tour with Dr. Moeller. So he'll come back at six o'clock in the evening and take your questions. There's going to be microphones here on the floor and you can ask him anything. You can ask him anything you want. A couple of you came up to me last Sunday. Well, can I ask Dr. Moeller about this? I said, like, says, ask anything. You heard from Dr. York this morning that he loves sports questions. So, uh, so feel free to do that. You can ask him anything. And uh, I'm just telling you, Dr. Moeller is one of the great minds in contemporary evangelicalism. This is a remarkable opportunity. If you've got kids and grandkids who have questions, they're skeptics, they have some tough questions and you don't know the answer, we'll bring them with you to First Baptist next Sunday evening and let them ask him. Uh, I am really praying that this would be an opportunity for us to reach people with hard questions, to reach people who don't normally come to church, but would take this opportunity to, uh, to ask one of the great minds what, uh, what he thinks about what they're struggling with. I hope you'll pray about that and I hope you'll join us. Last event I'll mention before I say a few other things that you're going to care about is um, our marriage conference. It's coming up. It'll be here right before you know it. We're calling it Reclaiming Beauty. And listen, you need to be at this marriage conference. Your friends and your family need to be at this marriage conference. Here's one of the reasons why we're doing it. We, we can have conferences on, we have had conferences on just about everything. But we want to have a conference on marriage because there are few things that I can think of and few things that you can think of that are as under attack as the institution of marriage. And it's not enough to just defend the institution of marriage. We want to reclaim the institution of marriage. We want to, we want to present a portrait of marriage which is as beautiful as it really, really is. And so on February 16th to 18th, we're going to have this conference. You can find out more about it and register at fbcjacks.com slash marriage. You do have to register to attend the conference, and there is a fee to attend the conference. And that is because of some of the resources that we're going to be creating. That's because of some of the speakers that we're having come in. We're having Martha Peace come in, uh, and uh, we, we, need to, we need to be sure we take care of them. And then also we're going to be providing food for everybody who comes to the conference. And so there is a fee for the conference, but I really hope you'll come. I hope you'll encourage other folks to be here. We really want this to be an important and a beautiful time where we talk about what marriage is and why it's so important. So I hope you'll come to that. All right. Let me talk a little bit 
about construction. We have a lot less construction going on than we did, but we still have some construction going on, and I want to talk to you about it. First of all, I mentioned uh, at the last Life Together Town Hall about the Hobson Block across the street. Uh, the plan right now is to tear those buildings down with the exception of the parking garage, with the exception of the Hobson Auditorium, but to tear those other buildings down and create a park. Now, I want to explain to you why we're doing that, what the thinking is behind that and where we are on it. First of all, the planning, we're at a very early stage of development on the planning. Right now we're just doing due diligence. We're talking to architects, we're talking to general contractors about what the cost would be, about what the logistics of that are. So we're in a very early stage of planning on that. We have to do something over there. One person suggested to me, why don't we just leave them alone? We can't just leave the buildings alone, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I stood up in our old auditorium in 2019, and I promised that we were going to rub out all of our deferred maintenance. Back then, we had about $75 million of deferred maintenance. And in the years since September of 2019, we have wiped out roughly $70 million of deferred maintenance. That's, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's, uh, you know how hard it was. The plan didn't work out exactly the way we'd planned for it to go, uh, but, it, uh, but it still worked out and the Lord was kind. Right now, our remaining deferred maintenance primarily is on that block over there. Those buildings are not salvageable. It would, to go in and renovate them, to replace all the electrical systems that have failed and all the plumbing systems that, would, that have failed to deal with all the safety hazards, you're talking tens of millions of dollars to do that. We're not going to do that. We can't afford to do it. We don't want to do it. We don't need to do it. We're not going to do that. But we can't just let them sit. You can't let them sit for all sorts of reasons. Our tax-exempt status on our property only applies to property that we are actively using for ministry. If we're, if we're letting stuff sit, if we're not actively using it, then we have to pay taxes on it, and we can't afford to pay taxes on it. You don't want to afford to pay taxes on it anyway. Uh, and so our ability to actually use that property for ministry is coming to an end, and is coming to an end very quickly. Also, all this property around here that we've sold, we sold to people who want to build condominiums. They want to move people in here so that people will be our neighbors instead of ugly, empty buildings. Now, if somebody moves into your neighborhood, they move next door to you, and they don't take care of their house, they let it go down, they let the weeds and the bushes grow up, they let things fall off of it, they let the windows get cracked, and it looks ugly and it becomes a safety hazard, you get upset with them and you would say they are a bad neighbor. Well, we can't be a bad neighbor to the people who are going to be moving into the condos that are going to go up around here. We need to be sure that we're doing our part to take care of our property so that this is a pleasant place to live and that we are a good neighbor to them. I also want to keep my word. I told you we were going to take care of this and we need to take care of it. The cheapest fix, quite frankly, is a park. We want to have a beautiful park that is usable for uh, our congregation for fellowship. We want to have a beautiful park that is usable for uh, our city. City Hall's right across the street from it. We want to be able to welcome uh, folks that we're reaching out to to be able to serve them there. Uh, we're going to uh, surround it. Some people asked, we definitely are going to surround it with, uh, with a beautiful and a decorative wall so that it's used when we want it used and not used when we don't want it used. So all of that is going to happen. It's going to take a while because all these things take about twice as long as you think they will. Uh, but it needs to happen. We've got to do something. Uh, that will be happening, and I'll be keeping you apprised of the progress as we get through the due diligence phase and uh, as, we need, uh, as we need more from you more, and you need more information from us. So more on that later. 
the playground. You know we've been designing a playground across the street behind the East Building. That has been significantly delayed because of permitting with City Hall. Uh, we now know that City Hall has our permits again and they are processing that. And so you can pray uh, that that's just a logistical, practical paperwork thing that everybody has to go through. You can pray for that as soon as City Hall gives the green light, uh, we'll be able to start doing work on that very quickly and you parents who so want to use it will be able to use it as quickly as we can get it ready. Elevators. This, I have good news on the elevators. Here's the good news on the elevators. 80% of the elevators at First Baptist Church work. <laughs> Look at that. 80%. 80% is a high percentage. If you got an 80% on a math exam, you'd be feeling pretty good. 80% of our elevators work. Isn't that great? Nobody's clapping. I, I got a weak clap on the $75 million of deferred maintenance. I'm getting no clap on the elevators. All right. The, the West elevators are a nightmare. You've heard me say they are the oldest elevators in Jacksonville. Uh, we have the order to replace them went in last year. They're being measured and developed. It just takes as long as it takes. And, uh, and we are working to try to repair them uh, as much as we can, but it's just, it's just a frustration because they're at the end of their life and that is just the way it is. Uh, I'm not going to, we have an estimate on when they will be ready, but I'm just not gonna tell you what the estimate is because I don't believe dates that people give me anymore. Uh, they don't even, they're not even trying to lie. They just, they just don't know all the different factors that are going to, that are going to come into play. So once I develop a level of certainty that the date that they're saying they're going to come in is the date that they're actually going to come in, I will let you know. But right now, I'll tell you what, a church member, a precious church member, uh, reached out to me last week and she said, here's something to pray for. And she said, what if we prayed that the elevators, and essentially that the elevators would be in by the summer? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to pray that. And I got right down on my knees and I asked the Lord, Lord, could you get these elevators in quick? Could you get them in within three months? And so I'm going to ask you, because listen, those, those elevators... The other elevators work, the other elevators are great, but those are so strategic in that one parking garage that gets people where they need to go. And I do think it would be a great thing if we all just joined together and asked the Lord that those elevators would get done and installed even quicker than we have been told by the company. So I'm going to pray that. we got some other folks on the team praying that. I'd love it if you'd join us in praying for that. One of the most exciting things in our church is our Nocatee campus. So many exciting things happen at Nocatee. Uh, growth in every area of ministry at Nocatee. They've got two services that are averaging over 400 each Sunday. That number is growing pretty quickly. We have already started the construction to expand the facility to make room for the people around. The, the kids' ministry space is so cramped, it's a joke. Uh, so we are, we've, we're expanding the ministry footprint out there, and the plan is that in the next few months the foundation would be laid, and, uh, and they'll make good progress on that construction. Another great and exciting development is the sound renovation in this room. We've told you that we know that the sound in here is imperfect. And you know that we had a, a very generous member of our congregation who decided we had a 10 year plan to solve the $850,000 problem, about 85 or $100,000 at a time. And we have a very generous member of our congregation who said, Let, let's just take care of it all at once and I'll pay for it. And so they started that work last week. It took all these months to get everything ready, to get everything measured in here, to get all the materials ordered. Uh, the company is in here, in town. They did a lot of work last week, um, and they're going to finish the work next week. So you can begin to see some of the changes. You can see some of the paneling uh, that will eventually cover that wall. You can see some of the wires up there uh, that is going to handle some of the sound batting up there. The new speakers are in, but not being used yet. The plan is that it will all be done on Friday, and uh, the sound on Sunday should be perfect. Should be perfect. So, <laughs> what would you say? 
<laughs> yeah, depends on who's making the sounds. That's right. <laughs> so that's a remarkable answer to prayer, and we're very thankful. A few other things on financial update before we move on. Wonderful news with regard to our finances. Our year to date, our budget, we need $5,665,280. That's what we need right now today to do everything we're doing. And what you have given as of right now is $5,690,523, which means we are $25,000 ahead. Now, I don't know why you clapped about that and you didn't clap about the whole 80% elevator thing. <laughs> we got 80% of our elevators that are working perfectly. <laughs> All right, there you go. My goodness, you ought to take a ride on some of these elevators out here. They were great. We're $25,000 ahead on budget. Now, let me, let me say a couple things about that. When I became senior pastor, we were borrowing $100,000 a month to make payroll. $100,000, $125,000 a month to make payroll. We quit doing that. That was very painful. It was a hard it was a hard series of decisions to make. And now, at this point in the year, we are $25,000 ahead. And here's what that is. That is you being faithful. And that is you being excited about the ministry that you are a part of. That is you wanting to participate uh, and support what we are doing. And from the bottom of my heart, I am so thankful for your faithfulness. I am so thankful for your participation. And I'm glad we're doing all this together. And, and that's just an exciting reality for me to report. Another great news on finances is on Giving Tuesday. We asked you to give on Giving Tuesday. We, we're not having the downtown campus raise money for the Nocatee expansion. We're asking the folks who are using the facility to raise money for it. But we did say on Giving Tuesday, if you give a one-time gift uh, for the Nocatee expansion, and you did, and you gave $41,094.05 on Giving Tuesday. That's one day, one day of giving. Very thankful. And then... One of the most important special offerings that we take each year is our Lottie Moon offering. Uh, every year, this is an exciting part of your giving. Every year, so many of you tell me how much you love participating in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And this year, uh, our church contributed $209,734.61 to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. every penny of which goes to overseas missions. So I'm very thankful, not just for your commitment to this ministry in this city, but, but for your commitment to see the gospel of Jesus Christ spread to the nations. That's really, really exciting to be able to work together with you on that, and, and I am very thankful. All right, that's it in the way of update. I told you that we were also going to ordain some deacons, and we're going to spend a few minutes doing that. I want you to think with me about the office of deacon. This is very important. The New Testament sets aside two offices that are part of the leadership and the structure of Christ's church. That is pastors and deacons. And we're going to take some time to set apart some deacons tonight. And this is what the New Testament says about that office in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be first tested, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. As we begin this time of setting apart these deacons, the first thing I want to do is I want to ask Dustin Ryan if he would join me up here. Dustin Ryan is our chairman of deacons for 2023. You come on up. And 
if you know Dustin, you know a man who is an exemplary leader in his home. Uh, he is the leader of a family that is deeply committed to First Baptist Church. He is the definition of a servant, and I'm so thankful that you agreed to serve as our... <laughs> to serve as our chairman of deacons. Very thankful for him. The people who are being ordained, if you would come up, it's Caleb Diffel, Freddie Johnson, Chris Wright, and Steve Ryder. Would you join us up here, the four of you? You can stand right here and face everybody. You can just stand right here. Each of these four men have already been selected by you uh, as deacons. They have already gone through a year of testing uh, with various leaders uh, in our deacon ministry, and they have been affirmed by you to serve as deacons beginning this year. So they've, that they're standing up here demonstrates the end and the, even the culmination of a very lengthy process of approval and vetting. And we are, as they've already indicated, very, very thankful for the character demonstrated by you men and for your willingness to serve our congregation in this way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you if you'd get down on your knees. And we are going to lay our hands on you. And if you are an ordained deacon in our congregation, if you would stand up, just join us in standing. And if you would just stretch your hand out towards these men and our chairman of deacons, Dustin Ryan is going to pray over these four men. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for these men that have agreed to be set apart for care and ministering to this body of believers here at our church, Lord, the Bride of Christ. Lord, I thank you for their love and their kindness and their faithfulness to lead through service in this church, Lord. I pray for each one of these men that you would give them boldness and patience, that you would increase their faith, that you would increase their love for you and for this church, Lord, and that you would do mighty and wonderful things that would make your name known throughout this church and throughout this city, Heavenly Father. I pray that you'd give them strength and courage, Lord, to always do what's right and to always live for you and love our church, Lord. Thank you for these men. Bless them and their families. Watch over them, take care of them, and prepare them for what you have for them. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. The First Baptist bylaws also make provision for a special kind of deacon, for a deacon emeritus. We have two men being inducted as emeritus deacons. I'm going to ask you both if you'd come on up. Uh, an emeritus deacon is someone who has served as a deacon with distinction for a very long time in the life of First Baptist Church. And I, don't, I think you can tell by looking at them that they've been serving for, as deacons for a very long time. <laughs> the, uh, the first deacon emeritus I'm going to recognize is Dave Ramser. Dave Ramser. You know him. We're going to try to see if we've got time to answer a few questions that people sent in. But one person asked me if the days of Genesis were literal six days. What do you think? I, I gave you a DVD <laughs> yeah. on that. Okay. And you should know the answer on that. All right, I'll watch. 24 hours day. Six, 20, I'll watch the DVD. <laughs> All right. And then, um, uh, and then second is Steve Smith. Steve Smith, who. <laughs> now, you, you look at this guy and you think you need to try to run a football past him. Uh, but every week he's standing over there at that door, just the kindest, gracious, most godly man you'd ever want to meet. He told me 
get this, he's been a member of First Baptist Church since 1978. And I told him that I was born in 1979. <laughs> you just a kid. <laughs> so, w listen, we are so thankful for each of you and for your long service to First Baptist Church. It's men like you who make our church what it is. We love you and are grateful for your love for us. And I'm going to pray and thank the Lord for each one of you. Father, we thank you for Mr. Ramser and we thank you for Mr. Smith. We thank you for your hand of blessing on their service. It is our honor to acknowledge them, to thank them for their service, and to commit them to even greater service in the years ahead. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I ain't going to quit serving. Don't quit. Don't quit. <laughs> Don't quit. Never God bless. quit. Never, Never quit. quit. God bless you. All right, I think we've got a few minutes here. And uh, we'll try to take a few questions. You get upset when I call for questions and we don't take them. So let's see, uh, let's see if anybody sent anything in here. <clears throat> oh, there it is. Will we ever have another pastor's conference? Okay, listen, that's a good question. And it occurs to me that I actually haven't spent a lot of time talking about this. So first of all, the pastor's conference. Um, if... If you're relatively new here, you might not even appreciate what this is. The pastor's conference was a big deal at First Baptist Church. This, it was started in the 1980s basically for two reasons. Uh, it was started because so many people wanted to know how they were making the ministry work at First Baptist. And so they came here to learn how to do church ministry. Another reason it started, quite frankly, was because life in the congregation was a little iffy. Uh, and this was a place together, Jacksonville was, was a place together for the conservatives in the convention uh, who wanted to be sure that the leadership of the convention was in good hands. And so for years, people tell you this. For years, the featured preacher at the First Baptist Pastors Conference was the man who became the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And you just knew whoever Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Vines introduced as the key speaker was the person you needed to vote for that year at the SBC. Uh, so there was, there was a couple of really important reasons. So many people, I, listen, I go places and people talk to me about how much they benefited from the First Baptist, Baptist Pastors Conference. I've benefited from the First Baptist Pastors Conference. First time I preached at First Baptist Jacksonville was at the First Baptist Pastors Conference. Very, very important conference uh, in the life of this church. Very important conference in the life of the Southern Baptist Convention. We stopped doing the pastor's conference in 2020 uh, for reasons that might be obvious and some other reasons that, that might not be so obvious. First of all, we were doing construction and renovation and we didn't have any place to have it. Then COVID hit um, and nobody was doing anything. We couldn't get anybody to come do anything. So we had to quit for those couple of reasons. But here's the other reality. In 2006, attendance at the Jacksonville Pastors Conference was over 9,000 in 2006. In 2017, attendance at the Jacksonville Pastors Conference was just over 300. It was a precipitous decline. And here's the thing, we were spending just as much money on the conference with 300 people as we were with 9,000, because you got to fill up those days with all those preachers. Um, and it was, it was a very expensive proposition. And look, I'm just going to tell you, uh, here's the truth. This is me shooting you straight. Somewhere in there, um, somebody had to say, hey, look, if we're going to invite pastors to come here and learn how to do ministry, we got to figure out how to do ministry. Uh, and so we had to go into a season of figuring out how this ministry was going to work. And honestly, we just didn't have the right to host a pastor's conference. Where we are now is at First Baptist, we don't do things because we did them. That's a surefire way to get in trouble. If as a church you just do things because you did do them, you're going to get in trouble. We do things now because they need to be done. Um, I am all in favor of a pastor's conference, and uh, if it ever becomes clear that, hey, there, there would be a great opportunity for us to serve the body of Christ and to serve this congregation by having a pastor's conference, then we will do it. But we remember, listen, 
when every week we stand up here and we say our mission is reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life, that controls what we do, when we do it, and how we do it. We are, we are focused on reaching a city in Jesus' name. And if we get to the point where we do that so well that the overflow of that ministry can be to tell other people how to do it in their context, then we'll do it. But we don't have plans right now. Doesn't mean we don't do extra things. We just talked about that marriage conference. Uh, we're working on some other conferences that we'll be having. Uh, but we don't have any plans to have a regular pastor's conference the way we used to. Okay. Let's see if we got another question. Do these questions come from actual members or do you make them up? Where is the trust? So... <laughs> So the questions, I don't make up the questions. Uh, the questions come from you. I'll be honest, there have been a few times when I have asked people to submit questions in case no others came up. But so far, we haven't had you fail to ask questions. So I don't, I don't make up the questions, they come from you. Okay. What are you most excited about in 2023? Um, what am I most excited about in 23? I'm most excited about, I'm most excited about preaching through the book of Acts. And here's why. Because, so here's the thing. I am, I'm not a prophet. I don't have any direct line to the Lord that nobody else has. But I'm just telling you, when I pray I feel in my bones that the Lord is going to do something great. I feel in my bones that the Lord is going to do something marvelous. I don't, I don't know what it is. Actually, I've, there's only a few of you in here uh, that I've actually talked to about this because, because I, I do feel ignorant, but I just, I can't shake it that the Lord is going to do something great. And so I have this sense of anticipation about what the Lord is going to do. Don't know what it is, but I'm excited to, uh, uh, to preach through Acts and have all of us learn together about how to identify it when he does do something great. So that's what I'm the most excited. And I'm excited about Christmas. <laughs> but we got a little ways to wait on that. Okay. Um, what was something you learned in 20? These are all personal questions. Um, nobody's asking about how high the wall is going to be at the park or anything like that. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, what, uh, what was the question? I forgot it already. Um, throw it up there again. What was it? Well, there, what was something you learned in 2022? So I learned a lot in 2022. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what they said. Um, but I will tell you, the thing I'll mention here is, uh, so in between that third and that fourth brain surgery, I had really had it. I was as discouraged as I've, as I've ever been. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't hear out of this lousy ear. And um, I, was, I was more apprehensive than I'd ever been because every time I had one of these surgeries, they said, we're gonna give you the surgery, you're gonna be better. And then after, every time after every surgery, they need to go drill me open again to do something else that happened after the previous surgery. And so there was this moment where, and I've told some of you the story, where when the surgeon came in right before the fourth surgery and Lauren and I were just in there alone and I said, so if, if you've got to go into my brain again because the tissues don't like being cut open and sewn and cut open and sewn and cut open and sewn and you're going to cut everything open and sew it up again, what happens if there's a new leak? And they said, well, you, you need to know that this is going to place you at increased risk for another surgery. And um, if, if you get another leak, we'll have to do another surgery. So I was like, great. Um, but the Lord was kind. The Lord 
answered my prayers, answered your prayers, and there wasn't another leak, and I woke up and my hearing was uh, back. It's not perfect, it's not 100%, but I can hear where I couldn't, and I'm very, very thankful for that. That was an answer to prayer. Uh, and, and I will tell you, the thing that I learned is after the four hardest years of my life, everybody was texting and writing and posting on social media and calling Lauren and sending notes and sending flowers and sending cookies. Cookies, so many pies and cookies. <laughs> I'm sedentary. And I realized, I realized that after the four hardest years of my life, I, Lauren's heard me say it and the Lord has heard me say it, I, I feel like I must be the most loved man in the world. I just, I, it, w it was this overflow of love from the Lord, this overflow of love from you. And uh, I just learned in a way I never had in my entire life how loved I was. And so when I think of 22, that's what I think about. And I better quit before somebody asks another question that makes me cry.